good afternoon everybody um i let me introduce myself i am uh, dr punita lal i'm a radiation oncologist at uh, sanjay gandhi postgraduate institute of medical sciences in lucknow it's a tertiary care academic institute and um, i i we teach uh, radiation oncology to uh, postgraduate students and uh, my area of interest has been head neck cancers and uh, other cancers like breast cancers and palliative care so today um, i was given this mandate of talking about uh, something in head neck uh, cancers so i thought to myself that i will uh, talk about oral cancers the cancers which are so very prevalent in our part of the uh, country uh, because of the uh, tobacco chewing habits of people so i thought i'll discuss about the behavior the management policy and a small audit that we had carried out in our department so let's just uh, briefly to overview uh, an overview of oral cavity we all know it's it's the first part whatever we ingest whether in terms of food or water or air that we breathe this is the first uh, point of contact and it's got many parts like lip buccal mucosa anterior tongue floor of mouth alveolus hard palate and retromolar trigon it's got multiple bones it's got muscles nerves a highly complex structure and that's why its management is also uh, quite complex because of like i mentioned uh, the peculiar tobacco habits of uh, people especially from this part of the country they are prone to malignancies of practically all the subsites that are there in oral cavity region uh, tongue being one of them buccal mucosa the floor of mouth alveolar region uh, and uh, the the gb sulcus and all <clears throat> so i'm going to in the next half an hour or so talk about the magnitude of problem how we treat such people and the issues that we saw uh, which were prevalent when we analyzed the patient that we had treated so it's uh, to look at it globally it's an 11th most common uh, cancer in the world and uh, annually we have a load of 3 lakh new patients every year and uh, every year and two thirds of these come from the uh, developing countries not from the developed countries so it is a problem of uh, the developing countries or the third world in fact oral cancer is our problem we actually give one third uh, we contribute one to the uh, global burden in a uh, like third of the patient population comes from us and as far as we are concerned it is the third commonest cancer in india especially in males who chew tobacco uh, quite so often and if we look at all the head neck cancers one third of them are oral cancers in our part of the world unlike the western population if you look at uttar pradesh very little data but whatever there is it says that it's really high uh, in this part because of the uh, smokeless tobacco they uh, these people the normal population especially the male population of uh, the working population uh, takes uh, this uh, tobacco chewing uh, takes two tobacco chewing sometime during teenage and then they are addicted to it um some data had a long time back come out from mainpuri district which showed that it was really really high in that region now oral cancers they are very peculiar because um in their own fashion and that's why you address them uh, a little differently one they have an etiology present which is if you remove the etiology these cancers are preventable for instance tobacco is a huge etiological factor uh, which is <clears throat> which contributes to a large increase in oral cavity cancers there is some degree of synergism that tobacco has with alcohol and so um, uh, additional habit of alcohol actually for the compounds the problem most of these patients are coming from poor socio economic class they are uh, in their ages Uh, they are in roughly in the fifth decade or more uh, they are usually undernourished as baseline then because eating is a problem they become more malnourished 
so their body reserves are low they come from the strata where the because they are poor socioeconomic their educational level is low awareness is low their oral and dental hygiene is rather poor and tobacco of course makes matter worse <clears throat> a bit about smokeless tobacco we know that all betel leaf slate lime cat chew areca nut and all these sun dried uh, tobacco leaves they are all contributing towards chronic irritation leading to uh, you know pre malignant conditions like leukoplakia some mucus fibrosis which later on uh, get transformed into in about 5 to 20% of cases into uh, a, a malignancy a frank squamous cell carcinoma so uh, it is uh, and uh, most of the rural population if you see if if any audit you will see about 80 to 90% people have the tobacco especially males have this tobacco chewing habit especially in the uh, northern part of the country if you look at their biology these tumors are usually very aggressive which means that usually they spread rapidly they are advanced when they present even though it's such a accessible site you can see oral cavity you can see the buccal cheek you can see the tongue but even then the presentation is uh, very advanced quite often for variety of reasons and because of um, you know lack of awareness because of uh, shame because of lack of resources and also um, ignorance all those things contribute and rapid growth then uh, also surgery is plays a very important part of uh, role in these tumors but even then the results are not as good as other sites other ent sites that we deal with this is what we have shown in one of our uh, trials now how do they behave we, uh, their behavior is aggressive like i mentioned and usually we look at uh, indicators that uh, which tell us whether the behavior is truly aggressive or not presence of lymph node is one thing it's a very important prognostic factor if it is uh, present that means the prognosis is generally not as good as patients where the nodes are not present but it gives you presence of node gives you a clear uh, you know indication about the treatment policy there's no debate we have to treat these patients with adjuvant treatment but if there is no node present then there's a clarity is missing and we have to look at other factors especially in early disease that that will tell us whether if there are poor prognostic factors that whether or not we should give further treatment in the form of adjuvant treatment or not so if we look at the management of these tumors surgery is the mainstay of treatment and surgery should be incorporated in these treatment uh, in these tumors as far as we can help it if it is early stage we should give single modality that is surgery alone should be sufficient but if it is advanced stage then you may have to combine it with further adjuvant treatment like for instance post operative radiotherapy you may also add chemotherapy along with that so this is the kind of surgery that you these patients often require types of surgeries uh, the principles of surgeries are that you have to take care of the primary you have to take care of the neck and you also may need to reconstruct the area for uh, you know to take care of the disfigurement part also and for proper function because we must remember that face is our identity and so when we lose out on there is when there is disfigurement of that part of the uh, identity that takes a heavy toll on our uh, mental psyche and functioning secondly lot of food we eat every few hours we breathe every uh, second and we swallow uh, every uh, few minutes so uh, if the functioning is not proper or speech we speak every ever so often if if we are not able to function properly then things will um, there certainly a, a sustaining of life may become difficult so we have to take care of the, uh, the surgical the defects that we cause because of surgery and therefore the role for surgical reconstruction as far as the primary surgery is concerned we the surgeons tend to remove the tumor 
and uh, excise it along with some margin around side with some safety margin so that whatever microscopic cells or spread is there is also removed by the surgeon in total in the in the single sitting so it is considered in head and neck region especially oral cavity that anywhere between 0.5 to 1 centimeter is a good margin for them to surgeons to handle once it, the tumor has been excised it is a it is a role of both the surgeons and the pathologist to orient the specimen send it along properly with clips or sutures label it properly fix it properly in formalin and then send it to the pathologist and the pathologist then uh, orients it before grossing, orients it properly and uh, gives you proper information after inking the surgical margin, taking proper measurements and then, uh, you know, cutting it uh, the way it needs to be grossed. So this is how they do it. They should label it, send it properly so that there is no confusion. And uh, the people who have to, uh, the decision-making physicians then can interpret the report uh, properly for them to decide whether or not to give radiotherapy, whether or not to give chemotherapy, and how to give radiotherapy, what areas to include. Coming to the reconstruction, so let if we take the example of a cheek cancer, so from mucosal, we see how big the defect is, whether that needs to be covered or that will heal on its own without any coverage, just a simple suture would help. Any moderate to large defect needs to be, uh, needs to be, uh, needs a flap repair, uh, whether it is a free flap or a pectoral muscle, muscle, myocutaneous flap, or if the defect is gone up to the, say, the mandible or any bone, then free fibular. Uh, the bone graft may be needed uh, to be placed. And the, if the defect is through and through from the mucosa or the bone up to the skin, then the skin also needs to be uh, covered and the flap needs to be uh, placed in these areas. These are few kinds of flaps that have been placed. Then the third thing that the surgeon needs to address is the neck dissection. The neck inevitably needs some kind of addressing from the surgeons and if there are any surgeons sitting in the crowd they would realize that neck dissection in all oral cancer is almost a very um, uh, it, it is an essential part of the entire surgical procedure especially if you're talking about positive nodes if there are nodes present there is no doubt the surgeon has to uh, treat uh, has to address the neck. If there are nodes, the nodes are not clinically or radiologically present, then they look at the depth of the primary tumor. We will come to that in a while. And if the depth is more than four millimeter, it needs to be addressed. Having said that, one has seen that earlier trials, uh, the uh, the oncology group trial, radiotherapy oncology group trial that was started way back in 1999. Uh, showed that the surgeons at that point in time in the country, in a country like United States of America, only one third of the necks were getting dissected in the same sitting as when the, in the single sitting uh, as when the primary has been dissected. The reasons, they were multiple. Patients were not reluctant, they didn't want a scar in the neck, the finances were an issue, if, especially if they were not insured, if there was unresectable disease, travel, because these were bigger surgeries and the absence of multidisciplinary care. There are several types of uh, neck dissections depending upon what all you are trying to preserve. Earlier it used to be radical neck dissection where everything would be removed just to strip off the lymph node chain but then they realized that was too disfiguring and too morbid uh, and uh, that told upon their uh, functionality of the neck region and the shoulder region. So now nobody practices that and modified uh, radical neck dissection is done uh, and it is of different types depending upon what structures you are preserving. If you are preserving the spinal accessory nerve which takes care of the muscular movements in the neck then it is a type one. But if you're alongside with that, if you're preserving the uh, IJV, the internal jugular vein, then it is type two. And if you're preserving 
uh, the nerve, the vessel, and also uh, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, then because that, that adds bulk to the neck and so the uh, asymmetry is less, the functioning is uh, very good and that is a type 3 kind of a neck dissection. Should the neck di be dissected along with the primary or should it be done as and when the neck node uh, arrives, that has been a point in question for a very long time until in 2015, about five years back, Tata Memorial Ho Hospital trial answered it very well for us and they showed that any time the depth of invasion of the tumor, again I'll come to it in a while, uh, is more than 3 mm, if it is 4 mm or more, doing neck dissection alongside in the single sitting with the primary tumor gives a survival benefit. It is better to do that than to wait for the node to come up in the neck and then to treat that area. Secondly, if the depth of invasion was more than one centimeter, then not only do they require surgical excision or, or dissection of the lymph nodes, lymph node chain in the neck, but it also, uh, uh, you know, needs more adjuvant treatment in the form of radiotherapy after surgery. So once you have dissected the tumor and the neck, you are ready to stage this tumor based on the AJCC. Currently, the world is practicing eighth edition of AJCC cancer, American uh, uh, Joint Committee of Cancer, Cancer Staging uh, Manual, which talks about the, uh, the, uh, the tumor, the nodes, the uh, metastasis, and also talks about other factors like depth of invasion and extra uh, capsular spread. Now, why is this staging important? Once you know the tumor, the nodal, and the metastatic status, that gives you the tumor-related prognostic factors. What are prognostic factors? Prognostic factors are that determine the final outcome of uh, cancer. In this case, uh, the oral cancer. So if we know the tumor size, the nodal stage, the metastatic stage, we know have some idea about what the outcome is going to be. But tumor-related prognostic factors are not the only factors. We have patient-related factors also like the age of the patient. Very old patient or very young patients tend to behave differently as compared to the middle section. Younger patients usually have very aggressive disease. Very old patients are unable to tolerate treatment, so their outcomes are poor. Comorbidities, diabetics, hypertensive, their outcomes are poor. Performance status, a patient who has very poor body deserves is unlikely to tolerate treatment even if he has a small tumor. So they are, these are patient-related prognostic factors. Then we come to the pathology. Once the surgery has been done, we get the final histopath report. We look at these factors which determine, will the patient, uh, does the patient stand the chance uh, towards recurrence and where would he recur? Will he recur locally? Margin positives will recur locally. Uh, if the depth of invasion is more, they will, uh, they will relapse in the node-bearing node region. Then other factors like perineural, uh, perineural extension, extracapsular spread, lymphovascular invasion, grade of the tumor, they all tell us what, how, to, uh, um, uh, how will this patient or this tumor behave subsequently. So if you look at the maximum tumor size of the tumor dimensions, bigger the tumor, more the, propen the, more the chances that the tumor will ultimately, uh, you know, uh, it, it will uh, recur locally or will spread to the nodes or uh, to uh, the distant sites. <clears throat> Then comes something that I have been telling that I will discuss, that is the depth of invasion. Depth of invasion uh, in, in general is, as of today, is taken synonymously with the tumor thickness, the thickness of the tumor, how deep it goes inside. Actually, there are slightly different terms. Thick, tumor thickness is the total dimension in one direction. The length and the breadth you take out externally and what happens inside becomes the tumor thickness. But depth of invasion means from the, the how deep is the uh, tumor from the skin or the mucosal surface. Why is it important? 
it actually connotes aggressive behavior. The more the depth, the more the isolated cells will get dislodged, get into the lymphatic chain and go and involve the lymph. So the lymph nodal involvement is determined by depth of invasion and therefore the aggressiveness of the tumor. Other factors, like I mentioned, grade of the tumor. Well differentiated tumors usually grow slowly. They are very demarcated, very amenable to surgery and they are they give better results well poorly differentiated tumors find it difficult they have infiltrative borders difficult for the surgeon difficult for others margins margin is a very important prognostic factor if the surgeon has left behind the tumor even microscopic tumor then the chances of recurrence become very very high and therefore it is important for the pathologist to report how far is the tumor from its margin? If it, is, uh, if it is reaching the margin, then that is known as positive margin. If it is close by, then it is a close uh, margin. And if it is far off from the margin that the surgeon has excised, then it is a negative margin. Anything more than five to one centi five mm to one centimeter is a negative margin, and one to five millimeters is a close margin, and anything that is sitting right at the edge is the positive margin. Other features like lymphocytic reaction, lymphovascular invasion, perineural invasion, they all connote good or bad prognosis. Lymph node metastasis obviously is a bad prognostic factor, depending upon the nodal burden your prognosis can be ascertained. If there are more nodes, more, multiple nodes or multiple levels of nodes that are involved, uh, if the nodes are large in size, then these are all uh, harbinger of poor prognosis. Sometimes there may be micrometastasis or isolated tumor cells that might be present in the node, which the pathologist may, uh, may uh, report but that prognosis may not be really certain. Extra nodal uh, extensions are there that the tumor is burst out of the node into the beyond the capsule and that uh, into the underlying structures or overlying structures. And that of course is a, uh, again, a independently poor prognostic uh, factor. <clears throat> and there are types of movement that the, the way the tumor is pushing, is it, pushing type it, it, or is it infiltrating type? Is it single cell movement uh, dislodgement? All also, uh, all these features also have some prognostic bearing. Other reports and other things that get reported in the histological features, which actually tell us whether the kind of prognosis that there might be, supposing there is bone involvement, obviously that's not a good prognostic factor. Nowadays, we are now slowly about the pushing borders and all, they are giving us information and pathologists are telling us about the worst pattern of invasion, which are of five types and anything between uh, um, one to three is a better pattern of invasion and four and five are worse pattern of invasion. They are bad and they connote that there is chances of lymph node involvement in these. So the pathologist, once he receives or she receives a sample, they must report it in this manner for the uh, surgeon and the oncologist to make out whether there, there is further need of any kind of revision surgery or any kind of adjuvant treatment. Coming to the adjuvant treatment, well, surgery is the mainstay of treatment, but it still has high relapse rate. And as the tumor becomes bigger and bigger, the relapse rate increases. So that's where the role of uh, adjuvant treatment in the form of radiation comes through. As a treating physician or surgeon, we need to risk stratify. Anybody who has low risk tumor and is actually uh, you know, um, uh, only surgery alone, a properly conducted surgery is good enough and you don't need to do anything further. If the, uh, the, the tumor falls into intermediate risk category, then surgery followed by adjuvant radiotherapy is required. If it is high risk, then it is surgery followed by chemoradiotherapy that is required for us to give optimal results. High risk situations are like extracapsular spread or margin positive. That's where you need to add chemotherapy also. Uh, 
But if it is a T4 tumor, multiple lymph nodes, multiple levels, PNI present, that is perineural invasion or lymphovascular invasion, those fall into the intermediate risk category and just surgery followed by uh, radiotherapy alone should be sufficient. Let's talk about radiotherapy. <clears throat> Right. So radiotherapy is, I will just come how we give it, but it actually means that we give radiation treatment, radiation, ionizing radiation to the, uh, the area which was tumor bearing in the first place or it still has tumor and to the node bearing area where there is either node present or was present or there is likelihood of uh, developing a node uh, later if we leave it as it is. So that area needs to be covered by a radiation beam. But at the same time, a good radiotherapy is when you try and reduce the toxicity as far as possible. Toxicity to structures which are sensitive to radiation and they cause impact on the quality of life. For instance, toxicity in the region uh, to, the, the, to the salivary glands, toxicity to the musculature in that, which will impact the swallowing subsequently or the spinal cord. So we give radiation either as conventional radiotherapy, which is slowly getting phased out because although we give good target coverage, but we are not able to uh, spare the uh, normal tissues. Uh, if we are giving by conventional radiotherapy, but if we give conformal radiotherapy, that is when we conform to the tumor or the tumor bearing area, you, you cover the tumor bearing area well, but you also uh, spare the, uh, the structures that, you, that are sensitive to radiation or they impact your quality of life later on. And so a good sparing is also ensured with conformal radiotherapy. How do we do it? We, every time we've taken a decision for uh, giving radiotherapy, we first simulate the treatment in uh, a place called a simulator, where we ask the patient to be lying in supine position, immobilize the patient, use this uh, cast, which actually uh, immobilizes the head and the neck and the shoulder region, which is what we do in all these tumors. And these are some devices which are kept so that the uh, radiation goes every day into the same treatment. So the head is resting here, or these are the types of neck rest, which, uh, which we put so that uh, the tumor, <clears throat> the patient lies comfortably. This is the cast, which actually is put so that the uh, patient, the head and neck region cannot be uh, moved while the patient is on treatment. So uh, this is our CT scanner where the cast has been placed on the patient and then the patient, uh, the CT is taken. This CT information is fed into dedicated planning systems or computerized computers where the plans are generated so that we best treat the patient by radiation beam. This information then goes into this machine, which is known as a linear accelerator. And linear accelerator, the patient is every day made to lie on the linear accelerator, set up as we had set up the patient on the simulator, CT-based simulator. And then the machine is uh, switched on and the patient is irradiated for a particular period of time. These are conventional ways of treating, which we used to treat earlier on, slowly phasing out from this. But when the cobalt, telecobalt unit era, we were treating, and say, for instance, in oral cavity lesion, uh, the tumor bed, lymph nodes, and the lymph node bearing regions were treated, and a dose of 60 grays was uh, delivered to patients in, in post-operative setting. And if the patient was treated with radiotherapy alone in case of, say, unresectable or inoperable tumors, then a dose of 70 grays was delivered. We deliver these uh, doses by different uh, fields that are uh, that are placed so that the tumor comes, uh, the, the radiation comes and hits the tumor bearing areas which we want uh, to get a certain amount of dose. Unfortunately, these are large areas and a lot of normal tissue uh, structures also get irradiated. Like for instance, if you're treating this entire area in green, you would be treating the entire musculature salivary glands, all of them get irradiated and naturally they show their side effects later on. 
if you see in this, we treat the tumor was here, but we were treating the positive node and we also were treating in the area, the green uh, box tells us that we were treating the lymph node bearing areas also. And why do we treat the lymph nodes? Because they have the tendency to get involved subsequently. How do we decide which lymph node bearing areas to be treated? Well, it depends upon the site that the primary site of the tumor and whether the nodes were involved or not. For instance, if the nodes were involved, node positive disease, then all of them uh, need to be, the entire neck needs to be treated on both the sides. But if the nodes are not involved, then also in anterior tongue lesions, we need to treat the, uh, uh, the nodal, node bearing uh, regions or the neck node regions uh, so that they should not um, relapse in the neck at a subsequent uh, time. There are individual situations which tell us how to uh, decide which area of which node bearing region should we treat. If the tumor has crossed the midline, for instance, then we should treat both areas. But if it is a very lateralized tumor, say in the buccal mucosa or in the small tumor in the tonsil, then we don't need to probably treat the opposite side. So we have these are individual indications and the guidelines are present to decide which areas to treat. Let's talk about how in the last two, three decades, the technical advances have changed the radiation oncology scenario completely. There are images which have come up, CT, MRI, PET CT and all. The simulators have become far more advanced. We now simulate with a CT image, which is taken on something that is known as a CT simulator. And then the linear accelerators have undergone a C change and they can actually treat more accurately. You can verify what you are treating, uh, whether you what you planned is what you're treating or not. You can shape your beams by these, uh, these leaves that are present in the path of the beam. These are known as multi-leaf collimators, and they can shape as you want for the tumor so that the normal structures uh, can be prevented. Earlier, we were treating by just seeing the X and the Y axis, the two dimensional planning, slowly the whole thing has changed and we now uh, plan the tumor in 3D. So the concept of three dimensions has come where thanks to the better imaging, we actually identify the uh, gross tumor, the area which might have some microscopic spread and the area where the tumor might be moving while the patient is being treated. So all those have been identified. Then as our knowledge and understanding has increased, we have also found that there are risk areas also within that particular patient. Some areas which might need full 70 grays because that is a high risk. They are at high risk to relapse. Then there are intermediate risk groups and the low risk. And they might you might grade your doses accordingly and this is only possible with the newer technology that is present. Now, if we look at the, um, the image that we get from the CT scan and MRI, we identify where the gross tumor is, which you can see either by naked eye or on CT scan. And then you see the, uh, the, the, the line in the red, the, uh, the area in the red actually tells that although there is no tumor that you identify on the CT scan, but there is a based on clinical experience and patterns of failure studies and autopsy studies, you can make out that the microscopic cells might be present in this particular zone. But because of swallowing, coughing, breathing, there will be some movement that you can anticipate while the patient is on radiation at that particular point in time. And so you give a safety margin, which you see with the area in the blue. So you identify these structures so that there is not a millisecond or there's not a moment uh, while the radiation is on and, and the patient is getting radiation that the tumor is out of that area or field. If you look at the how we moved from two-dimensional to three-dimensional, like I had mentioned earlier, this is, if we look at this two-dimensional plan, 
the entire area was getting good coverage but you were not able to spare anything everything was an innocent bystander be it salivary glands spinal cord musculature everything but with the modern equipment that is in place we are able to shape the beam in such a manner that if you see the parotid glands are lying over here and at least one parotid gland is completely spared spinal cord is spared part of the other ipsilateral parotid gland is spared so we are able to spare so much of normal structure and this is possible only with the sophisticated technology such as intensity modulated radiotherapy which most of us are practicing if we have uh, uh, good linear uh, accelerators present in our department where you can give irregular shapes to the beam you can actually um, you know give uh, optimize the uh, plan in such a manner that uh, the tumor bearing area gets high dose and normal structure gets spared or gets low dose <clears throat> so this is once again the same thing that you identify the tumor bearing area and you identify the uh, structure that you need to spare and you are able to spare so obviously such a patient will have far less dryness of mouth if you have treated by imrt but the outcomes don't change the outcomes have not changed from the older era to uh, now because you were giving very good coverage even with the older techniques so that one must bear in mind that it is the morbidity which is less i'll just talk a brief uh, briefly about the dryness of mouth well if you see in the older era the um, the earlier times we were treating the entire area get, was getting flooded by radiation and all the salivary glands were getting it so obviously there was permanent damage to the salivary glands which is what we have shown in the study that we had done but that by 12 months everything was dried up patient lived with that dryness but gradually with newer techniques that has improved considerably and so people have shown very clearly like there was a trial from uh, united kingdom which showed that if you gave good imrt and you, they compared it with the conventional radiotherapy and showed that you could spare the parotid glands if you were giving by conventional radiotherapy you would give as much dose if you were giving 70 gray uh, parotid glands would get 70 gray but here you could bring it down to less than 26 gray so naturally the dryness reduced three times from 83% it came down to 29% the outcomes in terms of recurrence rate or uh, survival did not change they were same but dryness was much less in these then there are newer techniques such as image guided radiotherapy which means that we take care of any kind of movement that is happening when the patient is being treated you manage the motion in such a manner that you are able to treat the tumor but spare the normal tissues and you are able to monitor its movement in head and neck we generally don't need that much of image guidance because the the you are able to put the thermoplastic cast that we had put immobilize the head and neck region in such a manner that you did not the role of image guidance became limited tachy therapy is when you give the you place radiation source right next to the tumor or into the heart of the tumor or on the tumor bed this is when you are delivering very high doses to the tumor you are also able to ensure a because of a rapid gradient between the uh, with every millimeter that you move away from the brachytherapy source you are able to give very low doses to the normal tissues and therefore you offer excellent conformality um, uh, conformality only thing is you have to be very selective in these tumors the small superficial accessible tumors away from the bone are good tumors to be given brachytherapy but it's a skill that you need to learn over a period of time and you can get wonderful controls if the tumor is very advanced obviously uh, things like brachytherapy are out even surgery slowly becomes uh, redundant in these tumors and you may have to resort to chemotherapy and radiotherapy when you are giving in borderline resection resectable tumor you may actually give uh, some chemotherapy downsize see if it is surgically amenable and then go ahead with surgery and radiotherapy 
But if you're not able to do that, then you go ahead and give chemotherapy along with radiotherapy to get as far as, uh, uh, you know, cures as possible. But at the outset, if you think that the tumor is far too advanced, then you resort to palliative treatment. So as the tumor advances, role of chemotherapy also comes in, except that we must understand that two local regional treatments, that's uh, radiotherapy and surgery, are the definitive treatments, and chemotherapy is only an adjunct to surgery or, more, more importantly, chemo, uh, radiotherapy. No story of head neck can be complete if uh, if uh, we do not talk about supportive care. These tumors are these patients are usually half of them are malnourished. They have they, because their mouth opening is less. Uh, the tumor is uh, physically um, you know uh, obstructing the passage, so nutritional access is less. Surgery has created malalignment. Lot of radiation related mucositis, dryness, and so feeding is a problem and that creates a lot of problems. So heavily bank upon enteral support in these tumors and they actually, uh, enteral support, if, if it is given in a timely manner in these intense treatments, then you can actually, uh, you know, take care of the weight loss, uh, even mortality. We have done a small study which where we showed that if you gave uh, a, a gastrostomy tube, then the weight loss is less, mortality is less. <clears throat> In fact, we had published some many, many years ago uh, a trial where we had shown that if you do not uh, treat them and support these tumors when you are treating them with intensive protocols properly, then you will actually land up with a very high mortality uh, and that needs to be really taken care of. A word about palliative treatment. <clears throat> if the tumor is far too advanced, then we need to take care of the uh, quality of life of patient, give them comfort, manage the pain, manage the wound, manage the diet, and whatever little uh, thing that is uh, treatment, cancer-directed therapy is possible, we give them. For instance, radiotherapy, short course of radiotherapy, if given, is a very cost-effective way without toxicity, can actually decrease the tumor burden and relieve the patient and their family members uh, from, uh, you know, discomfort of uh, bearing the disease, of bearing the pain due to the disease, and also bearing watching that disease in their uh, relative. And so uh, giving small radiotherapy, small chemotherapy is a possibility. And that has been shown time and again that that has worked. And it actually works both ways for the patient and the family. It's good and for the uh, the uh, overstretched resources in a, in any department. A machine which is overloaded, if you treat them for a good two months with radiation, you will not achieve anything. You will give side effects. The patient will still not get cured and um, you will not achieve much. And every day he has to travel to the hospital. But if you give short one week course, five days course, he comes, takes treatment, tumor is as downsized as possible and side effects are minimal and the patient just leads a happier life, a relatively more comfortable life, I should say, uh, than he or she would have otherwise. So, um, shall I put a stop? Because this I can I can just summarize it. It will, huh? I or should I continue? Okay, I'll just continue. I'll just continue to ask. So uh, we've done a small uh, <clears throat> study. Uh, we, we we audited our patients and we saw that some of them received surgery, some of them received radical radiotherapy, some were just palliative, some were given post-op radiotherapy. Most of these tumors, uh, most of these cancers came from around, uh, patients were 50 years of age, most of them were males, they had comorbidities like diabetes, More were, most were advanced uh, tumors of cheek or tongue. Can we 
imagine that patients had to travel about 106 kilometers to reach to to get a, a radiation uh, at our center. So that's the amount patients have to travel. They were referred from outside centers most of the time to get treatment uh, at our center. So I've said like two thirds of the patients received surgery. Most of them underwent neck dissection alongside with the primary treatment. And the pathology department took care and told us about uh, what the pathological prognostic factors are. All tumors who were T3 or above, all tumors, large primaries, large nodes were given adjuvant radiotherapy to a dose of 60 to 70 gray. And we found that our survivals were at five years, 30% patients were surviving. We had a large follow-up, loss to follow-up rate. Reasons are multiple. We'll discuss about it. And the failures uh, were largely local, regional only, despite such aggressive treatment. Patients were treated by uh, surgery and uh, those who were treated by surgery followed by radiotherapy actually fared better. So we had a lot of challenges in the form of multidisciplinarity in these patients and they needed a lot of support from physiotherapy, nutritionists, dentists and speech therapists. I think I'll just leave these. Uh, I just wish to say that um, because of a progression, financial reasons, un, uh, ignorance, reluctance, traveling, for a variety of reasons, we lost them to follow up. We never could know what their final outcomes was in a lot of patients. We also found that our resources are so meager for taking care of so much of burden of these tumors that it is, um, we really uh, want our uh, policy makers to look into it that the state of Uttar Pradesh gets more machines to treat these patients. If we are working on one-tenth the reserves and nothing is getting sort of replenishing of resources is also an infrastructure is not happening in the sense that if we just look at our example, we were treating at some point in time about 850 patients in a year um, in our department and we had two machines. Now we are going much beyond 2,500 patients and we still were working on two machines. That is the level of uh, resource constraint that we are working on. We are working on one-tenth what we require and that needs to be looked into by the, uh, the policy makers. Then not only do these patients uh, need radiotherapy or surgery or uh, chemotherapy at, uh, when they come first to us, they also sometimes recur and we need to salvage them again by re-radiation once again, depending upon their suitability or revision surgeries. So all this needs to be looked into. These are concepts which are emerging and we need to look into these patients. If we can salvage these situations, then we should because the results are still uh, promising with salvage options too. So to conclude, surgery is the mainstay of treatment. Radiotherapy is a prime adjuvant treatment possible. But if we omit surgery out of these, the therapeutic armamentarium, then the results are definitely suboptimal. And we must try and include both um, surgery and radiotherapy wherever possible. Radiotherapy, the lot of technological advances have happened, we've learned, our understanding has grown, integration of chemotherapy is now more or less established and firmed up, and it, it's a good salvage option as and when required. Pathology has improved a lot, radiology has improved a lot, we now know the prognostic variables are all important and we need to factor them in, in, our, in our decision making. Multidisciplinary approach is the order of the day and we must look into it. There is nothing that we can do without good supportive care and we must look into that as well. Over and above that, I think our documentation of all the morbidity outcomes needs to improve. The patient needs to understand how important the follow-up is as and when required. With this, I would like to acknowledge my entire team of the physics, the technical manpower, the neurotology team, the surgeons outside of uh, the uh, of our institute, the nutritionists, physiotherapists, they all help us. And this is something that we need to uh, avoid. Uh, this habit really needs to be eradicated 
from the state of Uttar Pradesh if we really want to uh, improve the longevity and quality of our, our patients, especially the young male working population of the state. Thank you very much.